Welcome to Everything Steam. I'm your host, Sam Stanford. As a physicist and structural engineer with Jacobs Engineering, I've made many connections with some bright individuals who are either working, studying, or self-taught and passionate about our particular topics of discussion. First of all, Happy New Year! I didn't really give you much of a notice, but I took one episode off and spent some much needed time reading, skiing, painting, and spending time with family and friends over the holidays. It was a much needed mental break from all the content creation, research, and work that I do regularly. But of course, the show must go on. This episode is rather exciting and a different approach to the podcast. Recently, two former guests of mine published their findings of a new species of Mosasaur. Now, I'm sure you're thinking, what the heck is that? So, in the episode, we are taking the entire first segment to tell you what a Mosasaur is, what time frame they thrived in, and all the basic info you need. Then, in later segments, my guests will explain their new species and tell the tale of how they discovered it. So, without further delay, let me introduce my guests, starting with Trevor Rempert. Trevor is a master's student at Case Western Reserve University studying medical physiology. Prior to his current education, he received an undergraduate degree at Northwestern University in biomedical engineering. And in addition to studying medicine, Trevor is an avid avocational paleontologist whose hobbies have taken him across the United States in search for fossils. Trevor's most recent project involves studying the biodiversity of mosasaurs in the late Cretaceous of Morocco just prior to the KT extinction. My second guest is Brennan Martins. Brennan is a third-year paleontology student at the University of Alberta and director of the Vancouver Paleontological Society. He studies lower to middle Cambrian fossils of British Columbia and has been an avid fossil collector since the age of five. Brennan is currently working with the Cranbrook History Center on excavating and studying a lower Cambrian fossil site with rare soft body preservation. And if you don't know this already, Brennan and Trevor are returning guests on Everything Steam. Brennan made his first appearance with Trevor in episode 32, The Cambrian Explosion. And Trevor, he's been an OG. I've had him on the podcast back in episode 13 where we discussed Earth's mass extinctions. So be sure to check those episodes out and learn more about dating rocks, fossils, the geologic timescale, mass extinction events, and how life changed after each event. So, now that you've been introduced to my guest stars and the topic of this podcast, we're going to head into our first segment where we will dive into Mosasaurs. Enjoy. Welcome to the podcast, Trevor and Brennan. Well, welcome back. You guys have been here multiple times now. Trevor, you've been on three and Brennan, you've been on two already. Yeah, well, this is your now, second yeah. one. Yeah. This first segment, we're going to get into the background information and kind of set the stage to talk about the exciting findings that you have for your species. So... Without further ado, I think we're just going to jump it over to Trevor because Trevor's the man of Mosasaurs, from what I've been told, and he has a bunch of information to share about Mosasaurs. So, Trevor, let's just start with what is a Mosasaur? All right. Uh, so, Mosasaurs, they were prehistoric marine reptiles that lived during the late Cretaceous. So, while dinosaurs were roaming the land, Mosasaurs were swimming in the seas. They... Uh, are evolved from small shore-dwelling lizards. So kind of like how whales, these small mammals that lived on the land and then they returned to sea, mosasaurs are also secondarily aquatic. So about, uh, I want to say 100 million years ago, during the Sanomanian Turonian, there's these shore-dwelling lizards. They're the ancestors of the mosasaurs. They're living on the shore. They're slowly moving back into the ocean. And there's a lot of uh, turnover in the ecosystem of the ocean. You're seeing uh, extinction of the ichthyosaurs. You're seeing the plesiosaurs are in a bit of a decline during the mid to late Cretaceous. And the mosasaurs are, or, or the ancestors of the mosasaurs are taking advantage of this. They move into these ecosystems. And within 25 million years, you get everything from like three meter uh, Dallasaurus, which is a very small Komodo dragon that would be like similar to um, the marine iguanas that you see in the Galapagos, all the way to these massive things like Mosasaurus and Tylosaurus itself, which are these huge uh, 40, 50 foot marine lizards, macro predators, apex predators, kings of the oceans. Yeah, for sense of scale, isn't a T-Rex like at its largest, like 40, 40 feet long? Like much longer than T-Rex. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So what is a mosasaur? It's uh, a relative monitor lizards and snakes. They're not dinosaurs. They're marine reptiles. 
Do you want to quickly like explain that just just in case? Because I'm not sure everybody yeah. knows their taxonomy here. Okay. Uh, uh, so dinosaurs are from archosaurs, which are the, the, the members of Sauropsidae. I think a good way to put that yeah. is that dinosaurs are part of reptiles. Yeah. But they're reptiles. You know, yeah. Yeah they're, yeah, they're derived ones. Mosasaurs are also reptiles. Mm -hmm. Different type, though. They're not in the same uh, grouping as dinosaurs because they don't share a common ancestor. Mosasaurs, they're marine reptiles. They were adapted to life at sea. Uh, they had these long, streamlined bodies. Their feet had evolved into flippers, helps them move, swim, you know, just like web feet. Interesting fact, they had two rows of teeth in their jaws. So they have the, the normal row, the marginal dentition, similar to like you or I. They have a second row inside their mouth. It would be similar like on the human palate. Those are called your pterygoid teeth. Those help keep food, because they're underwater, from flowing back up the mouth. Uh, and that, that's, a, that's a trait that they share with varinid lizards. Okay, uh, just, and, just a quick question. Sure. My quick research on mosasaurs mm -hmm. has brought me to an interesting debate in the scientific community, and I want to get both of your takes, because I've seen in papers and videos that uh, there's people taking stances that they're more closely related to um, snakes than they are to these monitor reptiles. What do you think about that? I think it's a touchy issue that the scientists are still debating. <laughs> uh, if you look at the early fossil record of mosasaurs, it's not the most complete. And there's these little characters that sometimes they point them closer towards um, squamy uh, lizards, uh, I mean, varinids. Sometimes it points it closer to snakes. Sometimes it points them closer towards um, iguanas. Let the literature fight it, <laughs> fight it out. And <laughs> they'll, okay, that's they'll figure it out. Yeah. That's fair. Yeah. Most people that I've talked to they seem to be in an agreement that they share a more uh, lizard ancestor, but um, I haven't heard anyone's actual opinions on the snake side, which is surprising. So I'll have to look into that one too. <laughs> yeah. Let's see, mosasaurs. Uh, other fun facts about them. Uh, they had a bilobe tail, some more to sharks, right? So uh, you, you look at a monitor lizard, right? It's got the standard lizard tail, just kind of conical. Mosasaurs, they adapted to life at sea. They have what's called a hypocircle tail, where one uh, they've got a caudal fin and the lower, uh, I forget the name, the, the, the fin is similar to sharks. <laughs> yeah, isn't it just like flipped upside down rather than like right side up? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. And the, the reason they know about this is because there was an exceptional specimen found in Jordan Jordanian phosphates, uh, what is it, uh, near Harana. And what it does is it, it preserves the soft-bodied outline of that upper fin because there, there's actually no bones in the upper caudal fin. There's bones in the lower part, not in the upper part. Interesting. Yeah. And just it had exceptional preservation. And you could see it in that. I think that was a mosasaur that they attributed to Prognathodon. Ah, uh, let's see other stuff. They might have had a dorsal fin. That's another one the scientists are going back and forth over. Uh, that's because the uh, dorsal fin, I don't know, th th there's no evidence in it for it in the skeleton, but some researchers like to reconstruct it because no evidence is not evidence against. Exactly. <laughs> uh, they gave live birth. Yeah, so they, they were very evolved to living in the ocean. Uh, mm. And you could see this evidence for this because one, there's fossils of neonates that are in pelagic environments. Um, so middle of the ocean, and you've got a neonate mosasaur, little baby swimming in the middle of the ocean. It, it, it wasn't born on shore. It wasn't born in an egg. That's interesting. Was that, is that something like innately like just based on uh, mosasaurs? Because when I think about it, most reptiles don't you know, give birth to live babies. Is that something uh, that just because they went back into the water, they just decided to go yeah. that route instead of going, I guess, back in time to the amniotes that were just, you know, you know, yeah, pre-calcified eggs? Yeah, so th that's an evolution for life at sea. Cool. Hmm. Yeah, because what happened is th their hind limbs are not connected directly to their spine. 
Mm. So they, they couldn't pull themselves up onto shore if they wanted to. Oh, interesting. Huh. Yeah. You, see, you know how, like, turtles, they put they they do the whole thing where they uh, they go to the one beach that they were born at, and then they slowly pull themselves up, and then they lay eggs, and then they cover them up. Then they return to the ocean. Yeah. Most people just couldn't do that. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Now, they had to give live birth. That's pretty cool. Yeah. And you, you see fossils of mosasaurs, like little babies out in the middle of the ocean. Uh, that was like, uh, they found a Clydastes, like really neonate in Kansas, which Kansas used to be underwater. It was <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Uh, and what else was there? Uh, th they found mosasaurs bearing young inside them, pregnant mosasaur. And it's evidence of, oh, hey, th there's no egg. <laughs> oh, do you know if they had uh, mammary glands? Is that something? Or th is that like no, something? No. That's a okay, mammal they, thing. Well, I knew it was a mammal thing. But, you know, it, it's it's just a totally non-reptile thing to just go into water and, and give live birth. So I didn't know if they were also cool. like, hey, let's just <laughs> let's try this out and see what happens. There's no fossil evidence of it. And I think there would be something in the skeleton that would show that um, they had mammary glands. And, yeah. and also, it's, that's that's like a very uniquely mammal thing. <laughs> that's fair. So what would they be eating at a young stage in the open ocean? Would the mother be hunting for them? Or do you think there'd be an abundance of food out there? They're lizards. They're, they're, they're not... <laughs> they're not caring for their young. Oh shoot! Oh, interesting. Yeah, uh, a little mosasaur hunts little things. <laughs> That's a great uh, way to put it. <laughs> well, what's the small stuff in the ocean? There's a lot. There's like uh, fish, uh, shell with cephalop cephalopods, like early squids and so on. Shelled cephalopods, like ammonids, the smaller ones at least. Anything that I could catch. Mosasaurs were very diversified too, so it, it really depends on the, which species you're talking about, mm -hmm. and that that can heavily influence their diet. Yeah, and, you know, it's a really great point to make is that they could also dislocate their jaw. So, like, you, we need to give a little more credit to the the baby mosasaurs that could actually dislocate their jaw and eat some bigger meals. I guess it's not just limited uh, in what you would think. I guess yeah, so. very op opportunistic, right? Definitely. So if you're in the middle of the ocean, what are you going to find out there, right? Fish. <laughs> Fish. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, the dislocating their jaw, that's an interesting thing. Because depending on the mosasaur, some of them had more or less uh, jaws that were able to, um, I forget, well, there's a fancy word for it, uh, uh, that, that were able to expand and uh, be flexible. Okay. Um, maybe maybe not yeah. dislocation, but but it was more malleable oh, on yeah. the jaw. Yeah. Okay. But but particularly like the earlier species would definitely be doing that. The later species they had more robust, less flexible jaws. Okay. So, the, the example there's this one mosasaur, very massive, it's called Pragmathodon. It probably was not dislocating <laughs> and like swallowing stuff whole. <laughs> it, it's it's just the size of the jaw is huge. The muscle attachments are gigantic. It, it wasn't really doing that much. Uh, and, and you see that to you see that also in things like mosasaurs and a lot of the later species. Okay, interesting. So we've kind of covered uh, what mosasaurs are. Mm -hmm. And we I think we've even touched a little bit about when they were kind of around. Um, do we want to say anything else about the time frame in which they were habitating yeah if it wasn't touched on before they existed during the last 25 million years of the late cretaceous period so that was approximately around uh 90 to 66 million years ago and mm -hmm. that's a technically quite a short time for these like super predators to appear and radiate and just get so diverse usually it takes um these groups a longer amount of time to take over an environment like that. But it's pretty insane that they could fill in the niches of like top predator to bottom of the food chain in most, if not all of the marine ecosystems um, during the late Cretaceous. So that's pretty incredible. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So is was it because of like, I think Trevor, you said it uh, maybe a little bit before that there was a fall 
in uh, in predators in the open oceans. Well, I guess not even the open oceans, but just it, it seems like in a lot of niche categories, like the what the plesiosaurs and help me yes, out here. The Cretaceous like seas the were yes, right. prone to faunal turnover, but where the, you'd have uh, different species rising and falling all the time. Mm -hmm. Uh, earlier in the Mesozoic, you'd have uh, ichthyosaurs and plesiosaurs, which mm -hmm. uh, uh, ichthyosaur is the dolphin-like one, and plesiosaur is the Loch Ness Monster-like one with the really long neck. <laughs> Come the transition from early to late Cretaceous, ichthyosaurs die out, and... Um, the plesiosaurs are in the decline. Okay. Is, uh, is there any like literature on why that happened? It, like just any specific reasons? Uh, I'm sure it's a mess of things, but like anything that stands out. Ocean anoxia, so uh, wow. decrease in oxygen in the uh, in the oceans. They think that that was um, probably what did in the um, ichthyosaurs and I want to say pliosaurs, but I don't don't quote me on that. But oh, wasn't yeah, this pliosaurs, kind of... they strictly fed on ichthyosaurs, right? So yeah. you can see a little correlation there. Well, well pliosaurs, that they had some overlap with the earliest mosasaurs in the Tyronean. So uh, my understanding, just based on uh, climate geologic time frame, uh, I think at this time period, this was like the warmest the Earth was in a long, long, long time. So I can definitely see where there was an issue with oxygenation in in the uh open oceans uh the cretaceous was a global hothouse uh, yeah. it was very warm and i'm not so sure i'd say warmest but i'm i <laughs> no that's why i said very long time yeah. i'm not saying warmest that's that's extremely false hmm. i but think the kpg yeah. was like at the kpg boundary was like 15 degrees celsius uh, mm -hmm. on average more than what it is today of course these are round numbers remember <laughs> uh where did they live because we, we said open oceans marine environments but it seems like from what you're saying it's extremely niche down so do you have any um you know further information so mosasaurs adapted to live everywhere the <laughs> fossils have been found on all continents including antarctica nice when they it, it, it's widely thought that mosasaurs they were able to cross oceans and they were able to swim long distances although they also seem to have a certain level of uh, uh regionality where mm -hmm. certain types of mosasaurs they, they tend to hang out in more equatorial spots versus some are more uh adapted to the poles but that, that just kind of goes to show that Within, I don't know, 15 million years, they, they were just around the, the entire planet, adapted yeah. to virtually all the uh, ocean ecosystems. Yeah, and usually they, they'd favor that equi equatorial zone due to all the nutrients in the water being cycled there, so they'd have a lot more prey items. Uh, we know that mosasaurs during the late Cretaceous, like the latest part of the late Cretaceous, they were highly adapted to eating certain food items. So there was less competition between species. Um, a lot of them would have preyed on fish. Sharks were very abundant at the time. They would have been a big prey item for them as well. Um, other marine reptiles such as plesiosaurs um, would often fall prey to larger mosasaurs. And we know they definitely ate ammonites. There are some ammonites we believe to have bite marks of uh, mosasaur teeth going through them, which is a very interesting detail because some paleontologists say, well, the ammonite shell would have shattered. What are these like perfect mosasaur teeth doing in this like porcelain thin shell um, without any like cracks in it? So they could have been boreholes from other animals um, like sessile bottom dwellers, invertebrates, right? Or they could have been bite marks for mosasaurs, but there's not really a consensus yet on what caused them. But regardless, ammonites were a major food source for a lot of mosasaurs. Sea turtles were around, and they were definitely preyed upon as well. Seabirds, um, there's a lot of diving birds around during the Cretaceous and like the shallow oceans. And surprisingly, other, other mosasaurs, like the, uh, the top predators would just feed on any mosasaur below them, even their own species. 
Um, I'm pretty sure, right? Oh yeah. Yeah. A lot of cannibalism. Oh man. Uh, <laughs> Particularly in Tylosaurus, you, you see that a lot in the specimens you're finding from the Niobrar chalk, where their skulls have a lot of uh, tooth marks that were only left by other Tylosaurus. But you, you see intraspecific combat within other Mosasaurus too. Oh, yeah. Interesting. Is there yeah. any fossil evidence? Or is there any evidence at all of uh, sharks trying to attack Mosasaurus? <laughs> oh, yeah. Nice. Uh, Wait. Tooth marks are very common. Uh, are you sure about that? It's not just scavenging? That's, yeah, that's what I was going to get to. There's uh, some debate over if it's scavenging versus if it was predation. But I, you'd I, assume the larger sharks, if a, a smaller mosasaur yeah. was around, they'd go after it. Like, that's, that's just... The yeah. larger sharks, yeah, something like Cretaxirhina during the Cretaceous would definitely have been able to take on a mosasaur that's small to medium in size. Nothing was fighting the big ones. <laughs> Do you think... Do you think the definitive evidence between whether it was scavenged or whether it was like just, you know, live, live attack mm -hmm. would be uh, after effects of like infection or, or something like that? Like you yeah. would see effects of infection. And so, healing too. Yeah. And, and healing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, that's hard to find in bones. That there are, there are lots of pathological mosasaur bones, but finding out the reason for pathology can be troublesome at times. That's fair. Really common is you see the scratch marks of serrated teeth on mosasaur bones, and that, that would seem to indicate something like squalocorax took a bite out of it. You do see scratch marks from unserrated teeth, something like uh, Cretoxyrhina taking a bite. You also see scratch marks from mosasaur teeth that are very evident. You, you see actual shark teeth and mosasaur teeth embedded into the bones of mosasaurs fossils that you that you, that are just found and you, you you're looking and it's like oh hey that that's a that's a tooth from something else this guy got bit yeah from from my understanding uh Brandon I think you wanted to also talk about how mosasaurs breathe air oh want, yeah yeah so it, if it wasn't clear already from their reptilian ancestors, they did not have gills. They were not fish at all. Um, they would have come up to breathe like uh, modern day marine mammals, like um, seals and whales. And their nostril holes actually moved position on the skull to be more central um, instead of the tip. So when they come up, um, they can they can come up flat and then get their air and go back down. So it was, it was more advantageous to have it um, in the kind of closer to the top, similar to how whales have it like right on the top of their head. Interesting. So I, I hate to continuously compare whales to mosasaurs. <laughs> don't don't cancel me for that. Um, but I, I'm curious what like because, you know, whales obviously all didn't have the same teeth over time. They evolved in, in different ways. So what kind of teeth did you see or do you see across mosasaur species? Do you have any like cool uh, instances that you want to talk about in the earlier mosasaurs what you see is really common you got the conical kind of general tooth shape uh and when i say conical i mean like it, it, it's a cone it'll maybe have cutting edges which, which is called a carina it usually has curvature towards the middle of the jaw which is called medial curvature uh, some of them that also have curvature towards the back of the jaw, posterior curvature. Uh, and that's the more general, that, that would, the, the scientific term is plesiomorphic. That's the general character. Okay. Particularly in the later stages of the Cretaceous, around the Campanian and the Maastrichtian, you get a wide variety of tooth morphologies as mosasaurs diversify to take advantage of a whole lot of different niches uh because in the campaigning you start to see as i mentioned before the decline in other marine reptiles like um plesiosaurs but you, you also see a decline in certain species of sharks the specifically the large ones like cretoxyrhinids and so on they go extinct and mosasaurs happily to fill those spots and the tooth forms explode where you'll, you'll see, instead of this standard conical shape, you'll see these very thin cones for piercing. You'll see these very sharp cutting um, 
Some of them are that they get flattened, which is called laterally compressed, very knife-like teeth, uh, which were meant for cutting. You get these big, fat, dome-like teeth, which were for crushing. And these mosasaurs, they, they used them for impulse function. So they used them for all sorts of different prey items. So the thin cone teeth, right? Uh, it's called Pierce Group or Pierce, uh, it's uh, Morpha Guild. Those are used for hunting fish. Those, those are seen in mosasaurs like the halisaurines, like halisaurus and pleurodons. Uh, smaller mosasaurs, fish hunters. Uh, you see these knife-like teeth in things like mosasaurus itself. Uh, you see it in a, a highly modified version of the knife-like tooth in a small mosasaur called xenodens, which is from Morocco. We'll get to it more later. Uh, you see it also in the mid-marginal dentition of Aramiosaurus. And these teeth, knife-like, are for cutting flesh. So it takes a bite, and it's using the teeth to cut chunks of flesh out from whatever it bit. Then you also have crushing teeth. Crushing teeth in mosasaurs of all different sizes. You have in the itty-bitty mosasaurs, these small little corn kernel-like teeth. And th those are in a mosasaur, it's called carinodens. It was a sm little small guy, like eh, three, four, five meters, give or take. Actually, I think five's a little bit too big. Uh, and what, what it would have done is it, it just kind of swam in, uh, swam around and it used those crushing teeth, eat whatever uh, benthic sea life or small shelled sea life that it could find, you know, crustaceans, aminids, anything that it could crush. Uh, you see, heavily adapted towards eating aminids, there's a mosasaur called globidens, with, uh, which globe uh, is like globular, circular, and then dens is tooth. It has this big circular tooth and would have been using those to crush up ammonite uh, shells. Wow. Uh, and you also see rather massive mosasaurs like uh, the, the Pregnathodon curiae and um, the mosasaur thalassotype, which was recently described. They've got these big conical teeth, heavy enamel on them that they were just like, it's like a hammer. <laughs> it, it, it would have been used for just crushing whatever was between the jaws. Interesting. I heard that, or heard, read. Mm -hmm. I read that the, Mo, is it the Mosasaurus? The Mosasaurus had like 33,000 pounds of, of pressure. That doesn't sound right. <laughs> <laughs> do you think it's more or do you think it's less? Uh, less. The, you think their it's jaws less? Were, yeah, the, their jaws were, um, they were flexible, like we mentioned earlier. Uh, I, I don't think that they had quite as much uh, crushing power. Yeah. Now, you know, some of them, they were adapted for crushing. But those ones had the shorter skulls, right? They're more robust, uh, more area no, for the muscle attachment. Not, not necessarily short, but they just had like mass, more massive. Ew, I don't like these sources. Mm -hmm. AZ Animal yeah. says something like Pregnathodon. I could see it having a strong bite force. Yeah, it's got a more similar skull shape to Tyrannosaurus, anyways. That thick bottom jaw, especially at the back. Um, okay. Ooh. I don't Ooh. know. I don't see, like I don't, it either. I don't have this. I, 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 I've never. You were reciting numbers to me. It's like I don't know any of them. That's fair. Just <laughs> so you're good. Uh, uh, it uh, says here 13 to 16,000 pounds per square inch and then the megalodon was 24,000 pounds per square inch i just don't like how they're I, I, I see that i see that on a website like that's the first result on google and that's a website that's trying to sell you teeth yeah right <laughs> well this, this is a different source this is uh yeah. easyanimals.com that's why i said i don't like the source but this is the numbers that i see uh, i'm Let's just say I'm, I'm gonna hold there. off on making a comment because I, I got a feeling that uh, I, I, I could say something very wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I just think the way that they try to quantify that is is probably pretty tough. I, I think you, you there's could definitely some figure out some muscle attachments though, and it, it, maybe you, your number is gonna have a large error bound on it, but you could kind of figure out that oh, T Rex is gonna have a stronger bite force. I think, I think it just depends like how, like how efficient are these, um, are these beings at making ATP to, to actually make the muscles move? It, that's so, that's so tough. I mean, you can kind of assert that, but how accurate it is, I don't know. Just depends on your level of accuracy you want. 
I I don't think Mosasaurus had that strong a bite for us. <laughs> <laughs> you heard it, you heard it, folks. Yes. Never said it. They uh, were weak on it. <laughs> I, I, I I could weak. be wrong. I don't know. <laughs> Cancel. I, I, I haven't. Cancel. <laughs> I haven't focused on that part of the literature, so I, I, I I'm I'm not. That's mm-hmm. fair. So my, I have I have two more things that I think we want to talk about before we jump out of this this uh, first segment. The first one is where were where are these fossils being found? I know you said like present day, like where's really good fossil sites for mosasaurs? Because you said that they have been found on all seven continent continents, but what's the what's the best? There's many famous uh, fossil sites where mosasaurs come from. Um, the most famous one probably is the type locality for the Maastricht, uh, Maastrichtian, which is the Maastricht formation. Up in the Netherlands, and uh, yeah, around Ma- Maastricht, the city, the fortress city. <laughs> and that is actually where the first Mosasaurus uh, skull was ever found. Oh. Mosasaurus was found before dinosaurs were discovered. Nice. And yeah. Well, well, when when they first dug the thing up, it it caused a whole lot of questions because it's like, what is this thing? <laughs> cool. So, uh, the the first skull that they ever dug up, it was impressive, but actually, it, it kind of, it never generated the attention that uh, the second one did because the, the, they dug up a second skull, and it was also of mosasaurus, a species Hoffmanite, but it wasn't named yet. And this big skull attracted the attention of scholars and academics everywhere because people are trying to figure out we're digging in this mine way deep at the base of a mountain and and we're, we're pulling out these bones of something that look like nothing that we've found before and scientists from all over the place were trying to figure out well is, is it a sperm whale is it a gigantic crocodile and it it, it became like a, a a rather important cultural artifact in the area and it also w- w- was rather important because um, during the Na- Napoleonic Wars, Napoleon sent uh, some of his soldiers, and this story might be embellished, but <laughs> some of his soldiers, yeah, you, never, you can never know. Some of the soldiers, when they seized the city of uh, Maastricht, they specifically did not shoot at the building that was supposed to be housing the, the skull because they wanted to take the skull. Because it's like, well, well, here's this big war treasure. We want to, we, we want to take this thing. So secretly, the skull was hidden away in the city. So what they did is they offered whoever turns it in 600 bottles of really good wine. <laughs> wow! Within one day, 12 grenadiers. Uh, they found the skull. They brought it to the French army, and th- that's why the holotype skull for most of the source Hoffman I can be found in the. The National Museum of uh, Paris, uh, France, in Paris. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah, not in the yeah. Netherlands. Nice. So okay. wait, this was in the 1700s, right? This oh, like yeah, 60s, really 1760s. Early. Wow. Uh, wow. Yeah, I, I, I don't have that. that was before. Yeah, that was before. Like people thought, yeah. like, well, they well, just didn't think anything ever went extinct at that time, which is extremely oh yeah. revolutionary to find that. So one of the people to study that first skull of Mosasaurus Hoffman I, well, the, no, the second skull, the first one was unremarkable. <laughs> <laughs> oh my they, goodness. They, they had one skull and nobody bothered to look at it for a long time. <laughs> oh. it, it, it's, it's in the Tyler's Museum now, which uh, that, that isn't in other ones. Uh, but the, the second one, the famous one, it got studied by... Um, George Cuvier. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And when he, when he was studying it, he called it the grand animal of Maastricht. And he and uh, Camper Jr., th- there's two campers that studied the Moses, uh, the early Mosasaurs. Those two correctly figured out that this thing was a giant marine reptile uh, related to uh, lizards. Interesting. It wasn't a whale, that it wasn't some sort of crocodile or something. And for Cuvier, it was very important for his um, his coming up with the theory that things can go extinct because that that, that was a rather new idea that like you know, species can die. Yeah, <laughs> it, it used to be thought that oh, you know, there, there, there's just there's always going to be more, and uh, if you kill every single one of them, well, the, the idea that something could completely stop existing was uh, brand new. 
Mm -hmm. That's a really cool finding. Yeah. I love that. So I think we're going to jump into our first commercial break because that was a long one. A great one, but a long one. So when we come back, we're going to be talking more about the discovery portion of the episode. So stick around. We're back after a long and luscious discussion out, you know, <laughs> away from the <laughs> recording. Uh, so we're going to lump segment two and three together just for timing purposes. And we just thought the flow would be a little bit better. So, you know, if you're listening to this and randomly get attacked by a, uh, you know, a commercial, sorry. But for this, for the segments two and three, we're going to be talking about the discovery of their new species, which is really exciting. So Trevor, do you want to take it away and give us the story? All right. Start so most stores lived in the ocean, but this one was found in the middle of the desert in the Sahara Desert. So Morocco, mo modern day, it's uh, very dry, very hot. But turn back time, uh, 67 million years ago, it was a small and shallow sea. And during that time, it was very, very plentiful in, in life, lots of fish and, and sharks and turtles, because this is, this is the equator. So we've got a lot of nutrients circling in from the ocean currents. And that brought in a lot of large predators and a lot of prey items as well. And now today, like I said, it is just barren desert. N no life on land, just sand and rock. But underneath all that sand, there are layers of sedimentary rock containing phosphates, which is a major product in um, fertilizers. So the area has these huge open mines where um, they're quarrying them for this um, phosphorite. And a byproduct of the phosphorite mining is a lot of the fossils from these creatures that lived in the ocean at the time coming out of the cliffs as they're digging. And these uh, the locals, they're in it for the phosphates. That's the major industry that's going on in Morocco. And uh, they take up a hobby of collecting these fossils that are coming out of these phosphate cliffs in the mines and selling them in markets as, as tourist items, as, um, um, as in larger quantities to gift shops around the world. Um, they're huge export and import, not just for hobby sales as well. And they're taking full advantage of this, this bountiful amount of fossils, not only from the Cretaceous, the uh, Moroccan phosphates also have um, layers spanning up to the uh, paleogene, which contain everything after the dinosaurs, lots of birds, crocodiles, fish, and sharks as well. And there, it, com it composes of three primary fossil layers, which Trevor knows very well. So, okay. Uh, <laughs> just to quickly res uh, restate, the fossil was found in the Moroccan phosphates. Uh, the Moroccan phosphates are a component of this large, expansive uh, plateau of sedimentary deposition called the uh, Mediterranean Tethian Phosphogenic Province. And this is an area characterized by phosphate, phosphate sedimentation that extends all the way from Pernambuco Province in Brazil through North Africa, from Morocco into all the way to Egypt, south into west africa and also north into the middle east wow this is this is all phosphate sedimentation this is all sedimentary rock it's all full of phosphates and it's all give or take the same age which is late cretaceous uh through to paleogene so it's the latest part of the cretaceous which is campanian maastrichtian and you also get uh, paleocene and eocene which is after the asteroid hits that's periods of time that were immediately afterwards where you get, um, instead of most of you get like sharks and whales. Uh, so the Moroccan phosphates in particular within Morocco, they are a series of basins and the two that are the largest and the most heavily quarried are called the Ouad Abdin Basin and the Gontour Basin. These basins are heavily quarried for phosphorite uh, mining Phosphorite's a component of fertilizers. It's a really large industry. And as a byproduct of this phosphorite mining, you get uh, fossils. Because <laughs> in some of the layers, you got a lot of phosphate. 
And in some of the layers, the less usable layers, you've got a lot of like just prehistoric bones. And in the process of pulling out the phosphorite, uh, there's the layers containing fossils are exposed. And what's happened is, at least in Morocco, there's a, a really large commercial industry that's surrounding extracting the fossils from the Moroccan phosphates after the phosphor uh, after all the phosphate mining has been completed in a certain area. So you'll literally see there's all these big uh, like cranes and dozers and so on pulling out phosphate from the Moroccan phosphates. And then afterwards, you see all these guys in like buckets and shovels <laughs> and they're going looking for mosasaurs and, uh, and shark teeth and so on. And Morocco allows the sale of fossils. They have laws that encourage the commercialization of fossils. Uh, there's some countries that they're uh, rather protective and they, they say that uh, fossils are cult uh, cultural heritage artifacts and they're not allowed to ex be exported from the country. Morocco has a very different approach. They're more of the mind that uh, it's a resource in the ground that can be sold and traded. And as a net result of this, in, instead of having um, a whole lot of uh, barriers to who can uh, collect and sell fossils, the Moroccans just kind of like, they, they let anybody dig stuff out, sell it and export it. And as a result, the amount of science that's been done in uh, Morocco particularly has, has really gone through the roof because it, it's so accessible. So there's a lot of fossils that are being exported. And uh, Brennan mentioned there's three layers uh, where they're doing the mining. There's layer one, layer two, and layer three, or th they've got French names, Kush one, Kush two, Kush three. Each layer... <laughs> Uh, it has different fossils in it because it's from a different time. Uh, Kush 1 is Yaprisian. Uh, Kush 2 is Phoenician. Th those are both after the Cretaceous, after the asteroid. And then Kush 3, which is the layer where the Mosasaur was found, is Maastrichtian in age. And within that layer, you get Mosasaurs, Plesiosaurs, fish, turtles, rare dinosaurs, and pterosaurs. It's actually really interesting. that there You will find, even though it's a marine sediment, you'll find dinosaur fossils in there because somehow it died and it, you got bloat and float or just the, <laughs> it was crossing the ocean and it drowned or just uh, who knows the, the phosphates are so heavily mined that something as rare as um, dinosaurs that shouldn't be in a marine environment does get preserved. Hmm. So fossils are recovered as a byproduct of phosphate mining and because of the sheer mass quantity of mining that's occurring, it's allowed for a tremendous number of discoveries to be made. And Morocco is a little bit unique because it's a tropical environment compared to a lot of the famous Mosasaur sites like, um, uh, like Maastricht, like the Bear Posse, like Nile Brower Formation in Kansas. Those are a bit further north and they have less species diversity to them. Morocco has insane levels of species diversity. Uh, there's 14 recorded species and 11, from 11 genera, and that's just of mosasaurs, all in one area. You, you look at these other sites, they'll, they'll have nah, 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 three, four, five species of mosasaurs. Morocco has 14. Wow. <laughs> it, yeah, it's insane. You have a, an area that can support that many mosasaurs all in the same spot that you have so much diversification and niche differentiation within one site. Uh, be, because you, you'll have, uh, within the phosphates, there's two species of Mosasaurus, which is Mosasaurus beugai and Hoffmani. Uh, Hoffmani is more of a northern species. It's very rare in the phosphates, but it comes down south every now and then. Beugai is a southern species, extremely common in the phosphates. You've got two species of Corinidens, very small Mosasaur. It's got these uh, small little corn kernel teeth, that are used for crushing up stuff. Um, two species, Belgicus and Minomar. Slightly different shape to the corn kernel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but but within the phosphates, you can have two of them. So th there must have been some sort of partitioning between the two because you got two of them that are existing in the same place. 
You've got two species of globinans, globinans simplex, globinans phosphaticus. Uh, you have two halisaurines, halisaurus arambergi and pleuridon serpentis. Uh, halisaurines are the ones that they have the conical teeth and they were chasing after fish. Halisaurus arambergi is a little small guy. Hal uh, pleuridons, he's a little bit bigger. Uh, still a fish eater. You got two giant prognathodont uh, prognathodontids, right? Those are the big, massive guys. Fat jaws, thick teeth. Uh, Prognathodon curiae is the, it, that's the big one with the, like big cone teeth. And then the other one, the more recently described Thalassotitan atrox, formerly called, uh, it was called Prognathodon anseps. Uh, Thalassotitan atrox also has big cone teeth, a little bit sharper though. Uh, more marked carin on them, more uh, serrations to them, different from Prognathodon curiae. Uh, have one polyplatic carping, which is called Gaviella minus. <laughs> Bre Bre Brennan Mass, because I, uh, for like three years, I called it Gaviella mimus. And yeah, that's, that's no, it's supposed to be pronounced like Sukamimus. I, I heard the person who named it say it, and it's like, oh, wait, we've been saying it wrong this whole time. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, oh Tr <laughs> Trevor's only heard this in his head because he read this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I, I, I said it wrong for three years. That's okay. Um, <laughs> but the, the the net result being, you've got a whole lot of mosasaurines, right? You've got mosasaurus, globodons, pregnathodon. You've got one plyo body carping, which is a little unusual. Normally, you get a few more. Uh, and you have two halisaurines. There's one thing missing if you know mosasaurs, and it's that there's there's four major families of mosasaurs, at least in the later part of the Cretaceous. Mosasaurines, Halisaurines, Pyopodicarpines, Tylosaurines. Morocco has been studied extensively. It's had a whole lot of people digging stuff up. Tylosaurines were not recorded from the phosphates until just recently. I lost. <laughs> <laughs> nice. and, and and it was it was it's rather surprising that you didn't have a Tylosaurine in the phosphates. You got the rare find. Well. Uh, that that kind of segues into that. Now the question is, what is a tylosaurine? <laughs> Their most notable trait is that they have an edentulous rostrum on the tip of their premaxilla. What that means in English, at the very tip of the snout, they don't have teeth. Huh. Unlike mosasaurs, where you'll have teeth all the way up to the tip of the snout. Uh, there, there's there's other things that if you're a mosasaur specialist, you'll know. Oh, okay. Uh, Tylosaurines, they'll have um, uh, a flattened top to the syringular and the, the um, hymo arches on the uh, vertebra. That they're not fused, and there's a whole lot of the, the big thing is the nose. Okay, but I, I call it nose. I'm like the, 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 that's the Moroccan influence on me because the Moroccan <laughs> muscle doers they they call it the nose. <laughs> Mm -hmm. The premaxillary bone. The premaxillary bone doesn't have teeth at the tip of the snout. Yeah, it often called rostrum too, right? Yeah, what was it used for? Why weren't there teeth on there? What What are our uh, kind of guesses? Uh, there's a few ideas that have been proposed. Uh, the first idea was that it was used as a ram, that it's got this, this toothless rostrum that it could have used to just plow into whatever it's going to attack, right? And that ram would have just like stunned whatever was getting hit. And then it would allow the most to sort of like bite and tear and whatever. Um, and supporting that idea is the fact that the premaxilla, uh, the premaxilla is often like just really beat up. It, it is very commonly pathological and that there, there's uh, trauma to that bone very often recovered in the fossil record. Uh, but a problem with that theory is that th there's a lot of these, it's called a neurovascular foramina, which it's a hole in the bone that would allow for a uh, cranial nerve ending to go through the bone. And it's thought that the organ would be super sensory and perhaps not the best tool for ramming if you've got all mm -hmm. those nerve endings. Yeah. So, so the, the other alternative hypothesis is that it, it was used as a sensory organ. And uh, there, there's, there's some back and forth. Maybe it was used as a ram. Maybe it was used as a sensory organ. Maybe it was a sensory organ that just got, like, it did, because it's the front of the mosasaur, it did double as a ram. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. Yeah. 
But the premaxilla bone in tylosaurs is um, remarkable. The other thing about tylosaurs, they were big. They were, they, they were some of the biggest mosasaurs. They, they were also one of the earlier appearing families. So tylosaurus, like mosasaurus doesn't appear until a little later in the Cretaceous. Tylosaurus, it appears in the Turonian, which is early or early late Cretaceous. Uh, and the tylosaurians quickly become macro predators. Uh, rather quickly, you see, I mean, you see small species like Kansasensis and Nepulicus, which Nepulicus actually really isn't that small. Uh, and, and then you see massive species like Proverger. <laughs> and these mosasaurs would have been the apex predators of their respective ecosystems. Just they had these giant, massive teeth that would have just been used for cutting apart whatever they were eating. Uh, and they grew to these massive sizes. I mean, like 30 feet, 40 feet. Highest estimates are around 50 feet. Uh, if you look at older sources, sometimes they, they, they go above that. It was a big mosasaur. And tylosaurs, were, they were in the decline in the latest part of the Cretaceous. So the, they had their heyday in the middle of the early Cretaceous, particularly around like Santonian through about Campanian. Right around the Campanian, though, the, 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 there was a decline in their prevalence, not in their diversity. Their diversity was always kind of low. Uh, but their prevalence started to go down. And uh, the, the last recorded Talosaurin was Hainosaurus bernardi, which was from Belgium, the Sipwe chalk up there. And that was from the early Maastrichtian. There was no record of uh, Tylosaurians into the latest Maastrichtian, aside from isolated teeth and uh, like isolated, there was one isolated paddle bone from the Jordanian phosphates, but weren't really um, diagnostic. So in the Moroccan phosphates, you've got a gigantic abundance of mosasaurs and there's no Tylosaurian presence. And that, that's, Kind of uh, unusual. <laughs> it's like, wh where's the tylosaur? And this gets into the start of our story. The Tucson show around, I think it was like 2012. So for those that don't know, every year in the city of uh, Tucson, Arizona, there's a massive fossil show where just it's the largest show in the world where you, you get fossils from all over the place they're just like for sale all, all, all the dealers meet up in this one city and they have this gigantic show uh and, and that's one of the places where like museums will buy specimens where collectors will go pick up rare stuff uh it, it's a, a truly a spectacle the event and it happens every year in february during one of these shows a uh, fossil collector his name is george Cornell. He's looking through the Moroccan booths and he comes across this one bone, which he recognizes is unusual. It's a mosasaur bone. It's the premaxillary bone. And it's got all the hallmark, hallmarks of a tylosaurian rostrum. And he has to try and figure out like, wait a minute, th there's no tylosaurians that are described in Morocco. What's going on? Uh, and I know he bought that specimen. And I also know that he emailed the mosasaur researcher and Schulp about it. And there, there was there was never any follow up. Nobody, nobody it, 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 it's one of those things where it's like, hey, I've got this unusual bone. I'm not sure what it is. Uh, are you interested? I, I think you wanted to like donate or let them look at it. And the, 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 there wasn't really any follow up after that, um, which he was probably busy. Um, I know after that, around 2014, 15 ish, uh, Moroccan researcher, his name is Sereg Noun. And what he did is he put together a little uh, a forum thread, which is you know the best place for getting scientific information. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and he just kind of listed out because he was in Morocco and he sees the fossils that are being pulled out of the phosphates all the time, and because he's local, he he, he sees everything. And he just kind of made a list of all of the different types of mosasaurs that he's seeing, and included in there was tylosaurs. He calls it tylosaurs, uh, which he thought because th there were loose bones and he, actually he even found a skull of this mosasaur that looks tylosaurian 
the scientists haven't researched it yet. So he, he's just kind of like, listen, hey, hey, here's these bones. Here's a couple pictures of like what's being put out of the phosphates. If anybody wants to look at this further, it's like, it, it, here's a reference and like send me a message sort of thing. That was like in 2000, I want to say 14. Then there's, there's kind of nothing. Because it's like, well, well, well there, there's, but the, but the rumors are out there that, hey, that, that, uh, we think there might be a Tylosaurine in Morocco, which is contrary to what the literature is saying, which is that there's no Tylosaurine. And, and you'll see publications like uh, uh, up until 2015, 16, 17, they, they, they always record the uh, Moroccan phosphates, no Tylosaurine in it. Not, not even reference to like indeterminate uh, loose material. Now, enter myself and Brennan, or particularly <laughs> myself. Uh, I want to say it's 2019, 2020, give or take. I'm a biomedical engineer at Northwestern, just, you know, taking classes and suffering. <laughs> and like like every good engineer, I've got a hobby <laughs> that yeah. I use to distract myself from the pain. Uh, and it, mine is fossil collecting. So I'm scrolling through eBay. The, the best place for, for you know, paleontolo paleontological discoveries. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm going through eBay, and and what what do I see? Because I, I kind of, I've read the the literature on like, oh, th these are what the different mosasaur teeth look like. At this point, I I did not know much about mosasaurs at all. I'm just scrolling through, and I see, hey, hey, here's a unique one. It was a tooth of a mosasaur that was very sharp, unlike all the other teeth that have been found from the phosphates and recorded. And it's kind of like, hey, what, what, what's this? This is unusual. So I, I, I go through the literature and I start reading through, trying to figure out what it is. And of course, I go back to the forum. I start posting, hey, does anybody know what this thing is? And a few people come back and they tell me, oh, it, it looks like a Moroccan tylosaurus. And I start asking for more information. Oh, well, what's Moroccan tylosaurus? We don't know. Scientists haven't studied it. <laughs> I'm thinking, oh, well, this, this seems kind of important. So. Like any responsible college student, I go back to the eBay page, and it's $300, <laughs> and I don't buy it because I don't have $300. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm broke. <laughs> so, but later, that very same tooth appears on the auction site, Catawiki, and I get it for a steal there. <laughs> nice. So, so now I've got this tooth in hand, and... I, I have no clue what to do next because it's like, well, what, 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 what do I do? I'm just a student, not a paleontology student, but it's an interesting looking thing. Uh, 2020, 2021 happens. Uh, COVID, everybody's locked down. Everybody's in their rooms, right? Uh, and what I do over the COVID break is I just print off every single article written by, there's this one most of a researcher. Her name is Natalie Barton. Great researcher. I print off everything she's ever written because she does a lot of work on the Moroccan phosphates and just commit it to memory. <laughs> and, and, and over COVID, I teach myself everything that one, well, no, no, not everything, but a lot about mosasaurs. <laughs> Solid. And I start to come to the realization, it's like, okay, well, we got a tooth. Tooth isn't really enough to name the mosasaur or, or to describe it or do anything with it, really. It's, it's just like it's a neat looking tooth. Now, the, the, the thing is, a, a tooth alone is because teeth can often evolve to look similar convergently, right? Um, you run into a situation where it's like a, you don't want to name something like a tooth taxon. And uh, you don't even want to describe something or like put it towards a family if you're not 100 percent sure, just because there's a whole lot of chance that there's overlap. And unless you really know what you're doing, it's isolated teeth is not something that you want to use for uh, paleontological descriptions. So I just kind of like sit on it. <laughs> Actually, I, I, Tylosaur, the Tylosaurian from Morocco kind of gets put on break because I, I, I kind of go on a, a tangent looking after the mosasaur. It's called Mosasaurus hoffmani. It's the, the type for all mosasaurs. And um, its teeth were also found in Morocco. And th that one was not also not described in Morocco. And um, 
a friend of mine. His name is Boob Kerchivy. He found teeth of Mosasaurus Hoffmani, uh, and he sold them to me. <laughs> <laughs> nice. And and those actually, th those very same specimens were the ones that ended up being used in the first paper I wrote on Mosasaurus, which is called um, uh, Occurrence of Mosasaurus Hoffmani Mantel 18 something in the uh, Maastrichtian Phosphates of Morocco. And I, I was, other people had noted that uh, Mosasaurus Hoffmani was probably in the phosphates, you know, forum, forum discussions. Uh, I was the one to put into the literature. <laughs> Uh, so, so because of that, I had this relationship with uh, the uh, the guy in Morocco. His name is Boob Kerchivy. He's a he's both a fossil dealer, but he's also a fossil digger. He he works with the local organization, which is called the um, OCP Office uh, Chevron de Phosphates, which th they're the big mining co uh, company, and he he also works with. Um, uh, ministry, the, the Moroccan government, which is called the Ministry of Energy, Mines, and Environment, um, and uh, they're the ones that like they'll they'll look over fossils and they'll approve like in order to export stuff from Morocco, you need permits, and it, he does everything legal. He he pays his taxes and does his permits. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know the menial part of, of paleontology. Yeah, so he he works with them, and we, we kind of knew each other through the Mosasaurus Hoffman I thing, and the Hoffman I paper paper it published on January fifteenth of twenty twenty two twenty twenty two yeah January fifteenth mm -hmm. it's about to have an, a one year anniversary yay yeah um and I just remember it finished up so I I, I sent a message to Boobger and I'm like hey. Uh, you know, there's some people that are talking about a Talosaurian rostrum. I mean, a Talosaurian in uh, Morocco. Here's some pictures of what the rostrum looks like, the, the one bone, that the premaxillary bone that doesn't have the teeth at the tip. Let me know if you ever come across one of these. I, I thought, you know, it's super rare. N maybe like five years down the line, he'll finally find something or such. Two weeks later. Nice. Good timing. Two weeks later, he's like, hello, my friend. Look what I found. <laughs> <laughs> nice. And what, what he found was what would become the first of two sin types of uh, the Moroccan Talosaur. Um, and that one he gave to me just be, because he's. I, I told him so many funny stories about, yeah, yeah, th this, this is a weird Mosasaur, and it's not like what's described in Morocco. And he, he's just like, oh, keep telling me cool stories about the Mosasaurs. Here, you have this one for free. <laughs> He donated it. That's uh, nice. Yeah. Um, and then suddenly, now we've got a bone, a diagnostic bone at that. The, um, well, no, the, the rostrum itself is not super diagnostic. But later, he found another one, more complete, that has uh, pre-maxua, both maxua, and the dentary in two fragments. And that one was very diagnostic because it had both attached teeth as well as just a whole lot of different bones and that one could be used to like name a species because like it, it's got unique features and everything nice you roped me into it oh yeah so, so through all of this i'm just kind of like sending messages to brennan like hey i'm working on this mosasaur thing you want to get involved and he says nah i'm doing school i'm kind of busy <laughs> that's and, usually how it goes yeah that was on the first paper yeah I'm like, ah, it's just Trevor. He's just being crazy because I've always mm -hmm. known him as this fossil collector. He's been buying teeth. He's like, ah, I love Mosasaurus. Here's a bunch of cool facts, right? Anyways, he's like, I'm writing a paper. You want in? I'm like, I'm kind of busy. I, I, I'm not well versed in writing, right? Mm -hmm. Then like a couple months later, his paper publishes and I'm like, he's a collector <laughs> and he just published a paper. Oh my goodness. And he's like, anyways, hey, Brennan. I'm naming a new species. Do you want to help me on this one? And I'm like, count me in. Holy crap, yes. <laughs> nice. I did not skip a beat with that one. Um, and then, yeah, he got me working hard on it. Holy cow. Yeah, he's like, oh, Brennan, I need to call you every night and give you updates on it. And, and we just, every single night, nerding out about mosasaurs and and all the the paleo world and all these papers and stuff and just uh, like a whole year of working and and calling and just 
drama and shenanigans, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's probably the best summary. <laughs> <laughs> Well, because the whole thing was like, oh, I had the tooth, right? And and then later, th there's a few more teeth that I bought up. And it's like, okay, well, the teeth aren't really, in, they're not descriptive. Like, sure, we can identify them, but it's not really enough for a paper. But what happened was as soon as the skull material started being found, it's like, hey, you know, this, this is actually a project that we could actually see through all the way to the end. Mm -hmm. And uh, Booker, to his credit, he just kept finding more and more of them. Nice. It's like, th this is something that, for the past, I mean, the Moroccan, the Moroccan phosphates, they've been mined since like the 1920s. And the fossils, at least, have been really heavily pulled out for at least 20 years. And in those two decades, there's been next to nothing from tylosaurs, with, ex with the exception of like, oh, one specimen that was at the Tucson show in 2012, and one specimen that the, um, the Moroccan uh, Sarah Gnown found and he restored up and he turned into a skull and he, he actually put on a traveling exhibit. Um, and, and then there was like nothing. So it was like, th there were two, two uh, specimens that were found in 20 years. And then suddenly Booker's just like pulling out like, Oh yeah, I found another one. I found another one. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Yeah. And it, this sudden explosion of, of just the abundance of material all of a sudden we're suspecting it's because they opened up a new section of the mine that mm -hmm. they're starting to quarry that has a deeper water deposit. So there's less Mosasaur material because all, you know, all, all the big guys are closer to the shore where there's a lot of food and everything's swimming around, but deeper out in the water, there's less food items. So there's less Mosasaur material, but that's where we're finding all these new Tylosaurine bones. Right. I, um, I wouldn't go so far as to say like deep shore versus uh, near shore. I, I'm not, I'm not. It's just a, it, we're suspecting it. It's not like it's a fact. It's just uh, we're kind of mm -hmm. like <laughs> the, the, the big difference is the majority of the mining has been occurring in the quarry around City Dowie, or it's called mm -hmm. Grand Dowie sometimes. Uh, and that's where you get really abundant Mosasaurus beugai and Thalassotite natrox and Gavella mimis and Mimus, <laughs> uh, Aramiosaurus. And as the mining slowly shifted more towards the city Shenan quarry, you start seeing a lot of these really rare species like Corinodens, like Hainosaurus, that which is what we ended up finding, the Moroccan mm -hmm. Tylosaur. Awesome. Yeah. Or what Boobker found. We gotta give yeah, that. Yeah, yeah Boobker. He found, found it. it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you didn't say the name of, of your species. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's called Hainosaurus Boobker. We named it yeah. after him. <laughs> Which yeah. is controversial. We were talking that yeah. before we started yeah. all of this. He insisted that we name it after his first name. <laughs> it, it, oh, there's too many people named Chibi. <laughs> so he, he wanted it named Booker. I'm like, okay, well, let, let's make it genitive Latin so it agrees with ICZN uh, naming rules. No, 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 no Booker I. It must be Booker. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and Brennan knows about this message. I showed it to him. He's like, <laughs> he said, it, it, if you mess around with the name, <laughs> I'll fly over and beat you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Hide well. <laughs> Very insistent. <laughs> yeah. so, so I'm just thinking, okay, you know, I, I got to read through the rules of ICZN. You know, technically, since it's not Latin, we don't have to make it genitive. It's like, okay, okay, just we're, we're, we're going to call it Moroccan Arabic. And Moroccan Arabic is the most agrammatical of the modern Arabic language, like uh, dialects. So we, we're, we're just going to call it Booker and just, just okay, we're going to go with that. <laughs> Not as poetic as um, yeah. naming a like naming the uh, Hinosaurus after like Obama or something like that. <laughs> I, um, I think Boobker is more important, actually. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there, there's already a lot of stuff that's named after like the city nearby called Udzem or the quarry mm -hmm. uh, city Shenan and, um, and so on. Like, the, yeah, city Shenan has a dinosaur named after it, Chenianosaurus. Uh, Udzem has I, I, uh, a crocodile, Maracasuchus or Maracasaurus uh, zenorana. <laughs> Zeranum, I, I, I can't pronounce it. I, I forget the name. But yeah, th this is this one we just named it after the guy that found it.
Mm -hmm. That's fair. Yeah. Uh, He did do the leg work. (laughs) Oh, he did. Because he he found the first Primaxua, which is the the first Sintype. It was like uh, Van PS uh, 13, 120. Then he found a a skull, a partial skull, really beat up. Uh, it was, uh, it had the Maxua, the pre Maxua, the dentary. Uh, that one was Van PS, I want to say 121. I, I don't, I forget the number. Um, that was the other sin type. He found a matrix piece, the big piece on matrix. Actually, no, I think he bought that, but whatever. He, he found it for sale. Uh, and, and uh, what, what is what it is is it's uh, pre maxillary bone and the maxilla bone from the same individual preserved on matrix. He found that, uh, and then he, he's found a whole lot of like just loose pre maxilla. Actually, he found one just today. That oh, was, nice. yeah, I know. Uh, it, it was actually a fairly big individual, too. So he found all of these and he sent a few of them to me. And Brendan and I are studying them. I'm taking pictures of this stuff. Brendan's working on the figures. Yeah. Oh my goodness. I, wow. I did all learn that from scratch. I never went through any figure making courses. So it was like a crash course into like how to make scientific figures. And I got Trevor telling me this needs to be changed. That needs to be changed. All these little nitpicks, but that's how I got perfect at it. It's just consistently updating, changing, fixing everything. But no, not, now I'm like very fluent in it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I know, like the teeth that we included in the figure for the paper, the figure is actually modeled off of, uh, there was a study in 1952 by uh, Camille Aramberg. He was the guy that first studied the Moroccan phosphates. And he arranged his uh, teeth in, on like the figure as a certain point, right? And he organized it where like the teeth, the teeth you have like the left, I'm, I'm, okay, the, the lateral view, and then you have, the posterior view, labial lingual views, and he kind of like drew arrows. And uh, when Brennan was making it, he used that as the inspiration. Nice. I went with the classics. Uh, yeah. No, they did it perfectly back then. Why not do yeah. it now with that? Yeah. So we, we we included views of everything. And I just remember the struggle was like reading through all the literature and trying to like nail down exactly what the unique traits for Hainosaurus Bootger were. Because uh, the Tylosaurine uh, morphology has, I mean, not morphology, the, the anatomy, and uh, like what defines a different species has gone through quite a bit of uh, back and forth. In particular, because uh, we went with calling this one Hainosaurus instead of Tylosaurus. And uh, those two genera were synonymized back in 2016. Synonymized meaning, um, there were two different genus of Mosasaur, Tylosaur and Mosasaur. One was called Tylosaurus, one was called Hainosaurus. And they were treated as separate throughout the 20th century. Uh, they were named back uh, 1800s, uh, and they were still treated as separate then too. Um, but there's always been a back and forth over what diagnosis, because they, they're similar Mosasaurs. And there's always been the back and forth between what diagnosis Hainosaurus is separate from Tylosaurus. And the big problem is Hainosaurus, the original one, Hainosaurus bernarda, was found in Belgium. And it's a heavily abraded skeleton. It, it's not, not very well preserved. Mm-hmm. And because of that, uh, it, it's led, a lot of, led to a lot of debate because there's also Tylosaurus, which is found uh, the, the, predominantly in the... North America, it's found everywhere, actually. But Tylosaurus is re- very well preserved, and there's a lot of individuals. And there's always been the question of, like, how do you separately diagnose the two, if they are separate at all? And different authors have proposed different things. Some authors have pointed to, uh, to uh, there's there's a feature on the pre maxilla to the maxilla, the little suture that occurs between the two bones, where in Hainosaurus specimens, it is called double buttress, where it has a sinusoidal shape. Whereas in Tylosaurus, it has a, not a sinus, so just a single curve. Okay. But that that was found to be an unreliable character because that's just a trait that's found in all later Tylosaurians. So okay. you, you'll, you'll also see that in Tylosaurus, Nepilicus, and Sasquatchuanensis, and um, 
pro rigor. Uh, other traits that have been used back and forth, um, vertebral counts, which it's somewhat uh, somewhat uncertain. The, the, the supposedly the precaudal series in Hainosaurus is larger than in Talosaurus, and it would seem that that is the case. But it in the holotype for Hainosaurus bernardi, it's also incomplete. So uh, perhaps that's not the best character for separating the two. Another another character that you see is like the shape of the rostrum, or the the um, in lateral view, the side view. Uh, the rostrum is very large and rectangular, although that's another thing where it's, that's just kind of generally diagnostic of tylosaur or later tylosaurines in general. Uh, the, the early tylosaurines, they had shorter, rounder, stubbier knobs, rostrums. I, I, I call it knob because tylosaur uh, translates to knob lizard. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the, the, the knob being the rostrum. But what has been found to be primary differentiating character between the two is the teeth okay yeah and what you see is because we talked a little bit earlier about the different tooth shapes mm -hmm. tylosaurus proper has teeth that are medially curving and conical very it does have carina on it cutting edges the carina are very muted uh they're very robust teeth so they got some uh, they have some weight to it but Im imagine a cone that curves medially towards the center of the jaw. What you see around the mid Campanian onwards is that Talosaurian teeth become less conical, less plesiomorphic, more knife-like. They become compressed, laterally compressed, where, where they thin out, the cutting edges become much sharper. The enamel becomes faceted. So like the, the, the very surface of the enamel, um, you get these structures that are like these uh, flat planes. And the, the planes, the, the, they're, they've got various uses. Like, uh, what is it? Like reduce the force needed in order to puncture prey when they're biting. But between the presence of facets and the change in the direction of curvature, because now they're, they're curving backwards instead of medially, and the fact that they're much more compressed, that is a recurring thing that you see that can separate the two, Tylosaurus and Hainosaurus. It's, that's probably the, the main differentiating character. And Brennan and I elected to maintain the usage of Hainosaurus because in general, tooth form follows function. So when you see a difference in the shape of the tooth, that also means a difference in behavior and a difference in prey preference. So what it's mm. hunting is changing. Tylosaurus was more of a generalist. It's got the teeth that it's in the, the Morpha guild called Smash. And it would have smashed whatever it bit. Is it biting a sea turtle? Is it biting an aminid? Is it biting a fish? Is it biting a shark? It's very much the idea that it bites, shakes its head, smashes, and tries to position whatever it's uh, eating so that it could swallow it whole. Hainosaurus, which is the later Tylosaurian, uh, the one found in Morocco, knife-like teeth, cutting guild. It, it would have cut chunks out of whatever it was biting. Uh, also seems to indicate that it was probably hunting less hard prey items, more soft prey. Slippery things like fish and sharks and so on. Also other mosasaurs. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah. The, 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 there comes a the, the, when mosasaurs reach a certain size, they just kind of eat anything. <laughs> once once they get big enough, it, it, you're you're king of your ecosystem, <laughs> and it doesn't matter what you're evolved to eat. You, you just you're the king. Yeah, so that is enough in paleontology. Just the mm -hmm. um, just tooth differentiation to. Um, allow you to claim another species you don't need genus. other you, yeah you don't need a, another genus excuse me you yeah. don't need another you don't need any more supporting evidence that's all you technically well, need well, 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 well. am hey, i jumping the gun here? it's a little taboo yeah. to do that but it in is. this case the mosasaurs have evolved mm. such unique teeth shapes that we can because ah. these are the, the latest mastrictian each mosasaur in the, the environment has a tooth shape that is extremely specific. So with most prehistoric animals, we people tend not to name things after single teeth. 
but in this environment it is very easy to do so because just like sharks all living in the same environment they have completely different t shapes from each other so it's very yeah. easy to tell them apart yeah, that's so, fair. yeah. yeah sh sharks are differentiated just based off of teeth because that's all that preserves dinosaurs yeah. you tend to not do that because they have a lot of convergence in their, the shape of their teeth especially with the theropods where the tooth from a theropod uh, there's a general shape to them and th there's a high chance that like you cannot identify differentially like which species it came from mm, cool in mosasaurs um you see a high level of differentiation especially in the latest mistricking species because just there's so many different forms that are going after so many different ecological niches mm. um and that's that's not to say we, we had cranial characteristics too <laughs> Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. It, it, it's just the primary one is the teeth. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Fascinating. I, I mentioned facets. The the number of facets actually uh, changes between mosasaurs too. So I I mentioned the enamel planes. Uh, you can actually count how many planes are encircling a tooth, and that is different depending on which species you're looking at. Hmm. The type of enamel is also different. Uh, it's unusual for a mosas for a tylosaurine mosasaur to have facets. Usually tylosaurines, they have striated en enamel, which is where the enamel is made up of uh, several lineated uh, parallel striking, um, very, very closely packed. I, I don't, I don't want to call them ridges, but like lines of, an, uh, of enamel. Whereas facets are more of a mosasaurian thing, actually, particularly the mosasaurus, where you got these planes uh, that are dividing up the enamel surface. Hainosaurus has facets on its teeth. Tylosaurus has, uh, Hainosaurus also has striated enamel because it's tylosaurian, but Tylosaurus has just striated enamel, no faceting to it. The, de the marginal dentition is highly differentiated in Tylosaurus, I mean, in Hainosaurus, whereas it's, uh, what's the word for it? Homo something, uh, homodont um, in Tylosaurus. So in Tylosaurus, what you have is the front teeth look the same as the middle teeth, look the same as the back teeth. In Hainosaurus, you've got specialization. The front teeth are unicarinate, meaning they have only one carina, uh, one cutting edge on the front side, and they're very hook-like. You you go back towards the uh, mid-marginal teeth, they're tall and knife-like. Very thin, two cutting edges now, and they're tall. The back back teeth, they're actually shorter, stubbier, bit thicker, and they, they look a whole lot like Mosasaurus, which has led to a whole lot of misidentifications just amongst like collectors and like even paleontologists sometimes. Uh, mm -hmm. Just because they, they look, if Mosasaurus and Tylosaurines, nowhere near this, each other on the same family tree in Mosasaurus, but the teeth do converge. At least at the back of the jaw, in shape. Cool. Uh, what else? As for skull differences, in Hainosaurus Boobker, which is the guy that we found and we described, what you see is there's a canal in the dentary called the McKellen Canal. It would have housed soft tissue and cartilage. In most mosasaurians, that canal goes all the way to the tip of the dentary. So dentary in mosasaur, lower jawbone, right? And that canal runs on the inside of the dentary all the way up to the tip of where the two dentary, the two bones, meet, which is the interdentary symphysis. And the, the canal runs all the way to the tip of it. In Hainosaurus boobker, it's delayed back to where the first tooth position is. And remember, it's a tylosaurine. So the teeth are delayed because it's got that rostrum on it. And that's unusual. That's not completely alien to mosasaurs because uh gaviella mimus also has a very it, it has a delayed mckellen canal considerably more than even hainosaurs it has like oh don't quote me i forget i want to say like the sixth tooth position it's all the way delayed back to but in hainosaurs boobker it delays back to the first tooth position which if you look at something like tylosaurus proverger it's going all the way to the the tip of the interdentary synthesis uh also the origin so in mosasaurs, where the maxilla emarginates uh, for the nares, uh, 
I'm trying to, what's a good way to describe this? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm realizing I'm talking anatomy to people that probably <laughs> don't know <laughs> lizard anatomy. <laughs> okay, uh, where the nose hole would be in the skull, depending on which mosasaur you have, that hole originates above a different tooth position. Sometimes it's earlier, sometimes it's later. Uh, and that's a diagnostic character. And in Hainosaurus, uh, Booker, I believe, oh, I gotta check my notes to not say something stupid. <laughs> I, I wanna say it, uh, it was the, it emerges below the four, I mean, above the fourth maxillary tooth. That's probably, yeah, fourth maxillary tooth position is where the premaxillary maxillary suture ends and the nares begin. And that's that's a diagnostic character that, while not an apomorphy, it is a character that's used to diagnose species. Okay. I got to explain that because apomorphies are used to diagnose species. <laughs> uh, just because it's not unique to Hainosaurus or Hainosaurus Bubker, it is a trait that is consistent through the specimens. Okay. <laughs> that makes sense. So I said it was heterodon. I talked about the different teeth, the faceting. Pronounced carina. I don't know if I mentioned this, but I'll mention it again. Tylosaurus has these very muted uh, cutting edges on the front and back of the teeth. Hainosaurus has very sharp, pronounced cutting edges that are serrated on both front and back. Tylosaurus has serrations too, um, but Hainosaurus has more pronounced cutting edge. And I, I think this starts to move into uh, what is the significance of this discovery? Yeah, what do you got for me? Okay. I mentioned in Morocco there's 14 species, including Hainosaurus, there's 14 species. Among species that could attain gigantic body size, Hainosaurus is the fifth one. Hainosaurus bubker is the fifth species. Uh, and that's rather astounding because you have one ecosystem and you've got five different species all supported by this ecosystem that are able to attain body sizes up to give or take 10 meters. Some, some of them more, some of them a little less, but a 10 meter body size, that's a huge creature. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but the conversion, give or take 40 feet, 40 to 50 feet. It's a big mosasaur. Yeah. Uh, and school bus the, size. What? School bus size. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. The school bus size comparison. Better whip out the school bus. Thanks. Yeah. So within Morocco, you've got um, Mosasaurus Hoffmani, which is the big guy, the, the, the one that was first described. Uh, the, the, I mean, the, the, the type for Mosasaurus. You've got Mosasaurus beyugai, which is the southern species. You've got Thalassotine atrox, which is big, fat Mosasaur, big, fat conical teeth. Super common, too. That's that's a really interesting thing. Thalassotine is really common, so much so, so that Brennan will sometimes hear me call it the, the gift shop Mosasaur because <laughs> it, it's so common. You go to gift shops anywhere, and you'll find, you'll find its teeth just there. Hmm. I mean, like, uh, uh, you go to Yellowstone, there's mo thalassotitan teeth in the gift shop. You go to um, Grand Canyon, there's teeth in the gift shop. Behringer Crater, <laughs> they're in the gift shop. Mammoth Cave. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's, that's, a, that's a neat little thing that the modern age has produced. Uh, what else? Pregnathodon curie. So what was it? Uh, two species of Mosasaurus, the last time Pregnathodon curie. Now Hainosaurus. You've got five giant macro predators and they're, they're all separated in their tooth morphology because pregnathodon curie has these big dome teeth that it would have been using for crushing the lacetine atrox has these big dome teeth that also have sharp carina to them so it would have been using them for crushing and cutting uh mosasaurus bayugai and hoffmani they both have sharp teeth uh so hoffmani has slightly more massive robust ones bayugai has very sharply faceted thinner teeth both meant for cutting apart whatever it's taking a bite out of. And now you got Hainosaurus also with these sharp teeth. And what it's pointing towards is you've got this ecosystem that had to have uh, tremendous levels of energy just in order to support all these big macro predators at the same time. Uh, so it's the fifth macro predator in Mos uh, fifth macro predatory mosasaur in the Moroccan phosphates, 14 species in the Moroccan phosphates. 
geologically youngest tylosaurian. Um, there's it it's because prior to Hainosaurus Brubker, the youngest mm, tylosaurian mosasaur was Hainosaurus bernardi. Hainosaurus Boobker comes from the late Maastrichtian. Uh, Bernardi comes from the early Maastrichtian. Uh, and uh, it, it's the youngest species that's named. So uh, when I say youngest, I mean it's the closest to humans, the last of the Tylosaurs, the, the one that was closest to the asteroid. There you go. <laughs> Simplest way to put that. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's also unusually equatorial. So Tylosaurians are known for being polar. Not, not 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 like very not, not only polar, but like Upper latitudes. High yeah, higher latitudes. Got you. you. You find it in North America. You find it in Europe. Um, uh, Tylosaurus is really common Western Interior Seaway of North America. Uh, <laughs> in the Southern Hemisphere, you've got what's called Taniwasaurus. I might be pronouncing that wrong. Uh, <laughs> another uh, high latitude. Mosasaur, Tylosaurian Mosasaur, and that that one you'll find in like South Africa, Antarctica. It makes its way up to Japan, um, uh, New Zealand. Uh, but within ec the equatorial range, right, or at least the sub sub equatorial ranges, uh, because Morocco is about 24, 24 north as a latitude during the Cretaceous. During the Cretaceous, not today. You don't really get that many um, Tylosaurians within the equatorial region or the sub-equatorial region. Hainosaurus, Hainosaurus Boobker is the, probably the first. No, it is. It is the first one in sub-equatorial region. Wow. Yeah. No, this is really awesome. That's a lot of that's a lot of really cool information, and you have a perfect evidence mm -hmm. in multiple facets to to state mm -hmm. that you have a new species. That's awesome. It's a Tylosaurian mosasaur in a new place, in a new time, with new features. <laughs> <laughs> Living in a place that's not supposed to have Tylosaurians. <laughs> that's fantastic. That's yeah. awesome. Uh, I'm I'm really I'm really happy for you guys. Uh, I'm proud of the work that you've done, and it it definitely shows. I mean, Trevor, you just you rambled for literally an hour. <laughs> about all of all of the details that you put together to mm -hmm. be able to make and stake your claims so it's really impressive and it's fantastic work ah uh, thanks yeah definitely i'm, I'm brennan, actually brennan come on take some credit hey. too you, you, hey. did, okay. you did great work on this no. too yeah being being an undergrad student and who wants to be in the field and eventually get you know my phd and become a paleontologist this experience has just been everything to me it's taught me how to write a publication and how the process of publishing a paper doing the research goes and it's something that most students have to wait till they're in their master's program to learn to get a chance to get a professor to teach them and i'm already learning that progress and that system now and it i just feel so lucky you know um no it, it's been an extraordinary experience to work on this and i'm so excited for the next projects ahead um doing paleontology work before you're an actual paleontologist is just it's something you rarely hear of. So yeah, it's yeah. it's extraordinary for sure. It, it really is a great experience and especially the collaboration because I'm or we're working with people in Morocco, like there's Boobker obviously, but we're also working with um, Ministry of Energy and which is uh, the Moroccan government because they're they're the ones that they're they're approving the permits and so on and we have a long dialogue with them and actually they, <laughs> they were really happy when the paper came out they gave Booker some sort of award <laughs> nice <laughs> well deserved. um yeah just, and yeah ha having you a artists, connection con uh, yeah. collaborating with different collectors from all over the place because i told you there's like uh we're, we're collaborating with the people that were at tucson we're collaborating with um uh, our third co-author, who's not here, Alexander, and he, he did a tremendous job uh, helping me learn Mosasaurus because there was a time when I was mis uh, mistaking Hainosaurus and Mosasaurus Hoffman eye teeth, and like, he, he really sorted me out, <laughs> collaborating with just other collectors, other amateurs in the community, uh, actual paleontologists. It, 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 it was yeah, yeah. a grand experience. 
and and getting the help of paleo artists to really bring the oh, project yeah. to life without paleo artists we wouldn't be able to bring heinosaurus boobger to life and to the public and the general audience because you can look most general like people that are not in paleontology they can look at the bones but it's hard to visualize what that creature would be looking like when it was alive yep. so paleo artists are like the most integral part of our project to make sure that our audience knows what this creature looked like when it was alive and to, to really flesh it out. Um, so we worked with a lot of paleo artists to reconstruct its appearance and it, it, its lifestyle, its color, um, and really yeah, bring it into the flesh, right? Uh, another kind of mandatory thank you goes to, um, we, we, we received uh, grant funding from uh, the Association of Applied Paleontological Sciences. Their society greatly helped us uh we also received grant funding from um the cincinnati dry dredgers which is a collector community very th very thankful very uh uh yeah just very thankful yeah and we needed uh, and, and the members of the, the fossil forum those guys yeah. were just tremendous helps incredible yeah. and my my community donated a lot of money for our right. paleo art and other finances as well. I did a GoFundMe and received just a heap load of support from that. So thank you to everyone who donated to that. This project definitely wouldn't have been possible without it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I couldn't give you too much money, but I gave you some and I'm, I'm, hey, I'm nice. glad. Oh, I was supporter. happy to have you, have you on <laughs> <laughs> and have you talk about it. So yeah, every little bit counts. Definitely. Well, guys, I just want to say this has been a wonderful podcast. And again, congratulations to both of you and your team. And again, thanks as always for being on the podcast. This has been wonderful. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, thanks for, for having us again. It's been a pleasure. Absolutely. Cheers. That is all for this episode of Everything Steam. I just wanted to take a quick second and thank Brennan and Trevor for taking the time to share their knowledge on Mosasaurs and their exciting publication. Definitely make sure you check them out on Instagram. You can find Brennan by searching at Brennan the Paleo Dude and Trevor by the handle at TFF underscore Prefectus. And Prefectus is spelled P-R-A-E-F-E-C-T-U-S. I would also love to mention my amazing team for their collective efforts to make the show happen. This podcast was edited by Ariel Piermont, marketed by Courtney Page, QC by Panya Pit Erickson, and our episode art was created by Gabrielle Edmiston. After the episode, please give our podcast a rating and review on whatever platform you get your podcasts on. We're always looking for feedback, and the rating would greatly help us out in the fight against the algorithms. Lastly, be sure to check us out on all the socials for podcast news, upcoming episodes, and just fun Steam content. Just search Everything Steam on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, and Reddit to join in on the fun. Once again, thank you for listening to Everything Steam. I'm your host, Sam Stanford, and as always, stay curious.